Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the morning sessions. Uh, first up, we have Python's Dark Corners presented by the awesome Peter Lovett. <laughs> Thank you, Eloise. I just wanted to double check that you're all in the right session. This is not the helicopters and rocket session. Um, <laughs> I'm actually surprised that there's actually anyone here. So I particularly wanted to thank you for, uh, for coming to hear about Python's Dark Corners. So I am a mad person. A little bit about me. I've been called to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, um, those who sit in darkness. So this talk is about um, Python's Dark Corners. For those of you that haven't met me, I'm a programmer, son of a programmer. I have three sons, all who program in Python. I counted up last uh, November, I hit a third of a century of paid programming experience. Anybody here um, over 33? <laughs> For the rest of you, I've been paid to program for a very long time. I've been running training courses. So my company, Plus Plus, uh, my principal role at the moment is um, running training courses. So I go into corporates, run training courses in a variety of languages. Um, my favorite, of course, is Python. And I've been running Python training courses from 2007. I've spoken at five of the last six PyCon AUs. Um, and uh, that's where you can find me at plusplus.com.au. So about what we're going to be doing, um, we are going to be looking at uh, mainly Python 2 with some Python 3 tips. I'm guessing most of you are still on Python 2, so the samples I'll be showing you are Python 2 with some tips around 3. Um, my objectives. Firstly, I need to check about you. Uh, who does a lot of programming in Python? Python expert. Okay, good. Uh, you can talk. <laughs> Um, who sort of dabbles in Python, pulls out Python when they can, um, prefers it to Bash, <laughs> prefers it to Perl? <laughs> who has never, who has sort of like seen Python and that's about it, okay? And who's never seen Python? Good. This is not a Python training course, I'm expecting some level of Python knowledge. Um, and uh, necessarily, this will be incomplete. I will not cover all of the dark corners, but I might just mention that I'm a little uh, sad to call this Python's dark corners. To be honest, really, there's not many dark corners. <laughs> um, the, if this was the, I don't want to bash the uh, C++ programmers being one, but if this was the C++ dark corners, it would be a longer talk. <laughs> Um, yeah, and <laughs> I'm doing a bit of work in C++14 at the moment, and that is challenging. So I have to start off by saying I love Python, but uh, Python is a fantastic language. Um, it's not perfect. Uh, Python is a little deceptive, because at first glance, you look at it and go, if, else, yeah, OK, colons, I get it, indenting, right, OK. But um, there's actually a bit more to it than that. And there is an elephant in the corner. And that elephant is four million hits. <laughs> Don't feel bad though, because Java got 10. <laughs> I also do a lot of work in Java and uh, appreciate it for what it can do. Don't feel smug about that though, because those screen captures are actually a couple of years old. You might have noticed from the style. Now, Python Sucks has gone down to about a million, and Java is only at 600,000. <laughs> this isn't a language comparison talk, though. The topics that I'll be looking at, um, albeit briefly, are uh, white space, about objects, names, floating point joy, uh, naming, some funky syntax, and a couple of other uh, uh, areas that um, I particularly find self-taught people fall over in. So let's start with white space. I love white space. So anyone, what does this print? If I is greater than one, uh, I is one, I, I gets one. If I is greater than zero, if I is greater than one, print non-zero, it doesn't print that. If I is greater than minus one, prints non-negative. So when I go and run that, I get 
nothing. Why? Un, uh, un, uh, unnoticed, I've got tabs and spaces. <sighs> the first dark corner has to be white space. People hate the white space. Uh, Non-Python people seem to hate the white space in Python. And by the way, I love it. Indenting, you should be indenting your code anyway. Your bash should be indented. Your C should be indented inside a control structure. Um, Python just makes it that you have to, and programmers seem to be upset about being told that they have to. But the big drama here is the uh, spaces versus tabs problem. So uh, how do I get around that? There's a few ways. One way, the, uh, the, a nice thing, a nice option that you should know about is minus T. If you don't know about Python minus T, I'd recommend running Python minus T all the time. If I run it on that, I get a warning. Inconsistent use of tabs. Or I might even bump that up and go, don't just do T, do TT, which makes those warnings, fails, program crashes. You also need to know your editor. You need to configure your editor. Let's just get rid of, get rid of tabs. <laughs> tabs are evil. Maybe I should have called the talk tabs are evil. So I love white space, but I hate tabs. Avoid those problem or that particular problem. Ban tabs. Configure your editor. Uh, there's a third party tool called Tab Nanny that minus T actually launches, um, but you can run separately or use the minus T, the minus TT options. <sighs> Who's learnt something so far? <laughs> Excellent. Who's completely satisfied and we may as well finish now and see if we can make that rocket talk? <laughs> <laughs> no? I, I, Sir? I have a sure. Oh, that's a really good question, yeah. The question was, uh, for the benefit of the, uh, the audio, how does Python actually treat that? Well, it actually treats the tab as eight spaces. So while I had configured my editor to show tabs at four spaces to confuse you, um, the Python interpreter is viewing that tab as eight spaces, and therefore it matched up with the print. Yeah, good question. That's white space. Next, we need to talk about objects. Uh, this isn't really a dark corner, but it's just re useful to remember that in Python, everything's an object. Plain old ints are objects. So if I have my Pythons, and you are catching that, yep. Then um, a good old int, you know, I, that's not your, uh, that's not your, your grandfather's int. <laughs> that's not four bytes, that's an object with attributes and uh, all sorts of stuff in it. So that has implications around performance, um, amongst other things. But just remember that everything in Python is an object. Functions are first class objects. Those on the functional programming track would have been uh, filled in on that. Modules, a module is an object. Uh, a class, a class definition itself is an object. And that has wonderful repercussions on passing things around. So if everything's an object, then we need to explore about it's just a name. Let me just make that a little higher so you can see it a little better maybe. So let me just check to see what you know. Let me go and get myself a list. One, two, three. With me so far? B gets A. Let me go and mutate A, append a four onto the end of A. A has changed. What is B? There's two scenarios here. It's changed. Um, that is, is it the same thing as A? Or was that assignment a copy? So those coming from the C background would be considering that that is a, uh, assignment takes a copy. But it's a critical question. For those that aren't sure, we need to be clear on this because this is probably the darkest of the dark corners in Python. And in fact, while I'm sort of talking about variables, I in, in one sense, Python doesn't really have variables. I'm going to ex excise that from my lexicon. We've got names and we've got objects. So A is not a list. A is a reference, a pointer for my C friends to a list. And that assignment is by ref. Now I could find that out, one by looking at B, <laughs> or 
or more interestingly, using functions like I don't use very often, like the ID function, having a look at the ID of A and the ID of B um, in C Python, roughly analogous to its uh, memory location. And if their IDs are the same, that's going to tell me something. <laughs> if they're pointing at the same thing. In fact, Python even has an operator for that, which is, 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 <laughs> the is operator. Not one that I actually use very often. It's not sort of a, you have to use it for most things, but is is a very handy operator there. And that tells me that yes, they is the same object. <laughs> uh, excuse my, uh, I'm better at Python than English, let's just say that. So if that's the case, that tells me that, that's, uh, that uh, everything's by reference, including passing arguments to functions. So the question becomes, well, what if I want to make a copy? What if I actually want one that's different and not the same? Well, I'll give you some options. Um, I could make a new list. Square brackets for my Java friends, there's your new. Making a new list made up of A0, A1, A2, and just for the fun of it, A minus one. Oh, actually, I never showed you B. There's B. C looks like that, but the ID of A versus the ID of C is different, and therefore A is C. No, they is not the same object. So if I mutate one of them, like go and pop the last off C, C mutates, but A doesn't. That uh, technique is not going to scale well. <laughs> <laughs> so if I want to go a bit bigger, I could do a D, uh, make a new empty list, um, get myself a counter, and P.S. this is the worst possible way, while I is less than the len of A, um, to D, go and append the ith element of A. And when I run that, I see why Py, uh, Python's performance gets criticised. It's taking quite a bit longer than I expected. Also showing you why I don't do it like this. That's the way a C programmer would do it. It sounds like I'm coming down on C programmers. I are one, is one. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> so when people complain about Python's performance, I say, well, you try counting up that big. So the first element of D, whoops, the first element of D will be one. The second element of D, I'm not going to go through them all. <laughs> the first 10 elements of D clearly why I don't do that. So instead, a more Pythonic way would be to not use the while loop. I'm not gonna ban the while loop because there are times where you don't know how many times you're going to loop. But if you know how many times you're going to loop, let me reset that so I can reclaim some memory, um, it would be to use the for. Again, this is not preferable, but for I in range zero to, but not including, the length of A to D, go and append the ith element of A. Again, a very C programmer style of approach. At least it was quicker. <laughs> and it did create a copy, but again, is not the, prefer the preferable way. The preferable way, of course, wouldn't be like that. But for loops are good. Iterate through a, and that's the closest thing I can give the C programmers to a C programmer style C for loop. But a more appropriate would be to not loop through the indexes because that's how you get in trouble. <laughs> that's how you get buffer overflows. Oh, not in Python, but in other languages. So instead, it would be much better for each item in the list. I don't have to worry about indexes. I don't have to worry about increments. For each item in A to D, go and append the item. And that's a preferable way of copying an object Still not my favourite though. So let me go and look at uh, another better way of copying an object. Let me, uh, just as an example, let me say I've got a number which is five and I've got a string which is, the number is, 
And if I print the string and the number, I get the number is space because comma in print introduces a space. I don't want a space, so I'll do some string concatenation. But you, uh, Python, while it's a dynamically typed language, is still a strictly typed language. Unlike uh, Perl, for example, that is dynamically typed and not strictly, it'll do whatever it thinks, <laughs> or whatever it thinks you mean. In Python, it's still a strictly typed language. So how do I turn an int into a string? str. And that builds a new string. I could call it the string function if I was a function sort of person, but it's really the constructor for objects of class str. So if that's how I build a new string, how do I build a new list? <laughs> Dude, you're a genius. The answer is list. Invoke the list constructor with an iterable, and this will build it from an anything, any iterable producing a new one, which is a copy. Ah, oh, P.S., even though it's a copy, if I did a value-wise comparison, those two things are, in fact, value-wise. Equal equal is a value comparison, not an object uh, comparison. They have the same value. Um, lists are ordered, but every element <laughs> is in the same order and also returns equal equal for true. And it's also the same object. Uh, yes. Yep, maybe. That'll actually be. Yep. So it's, it's just a name. Every name is a reference. Um, I'm tempted to say you're not allowed to say uh, variable. And the importance of is actually is not very important. <laughs> it's useful in a demonstration like this to help understand what's actually going on behind the scenes, same way that ID is useful for that. But in reality, we actually don't use the is operator terribly much in Python. Um, it's relevant whenever you've got objects of a singleton type, be that such as the true object, or the object referred to by the name true, or the none object, all singletons, there's just one of them, and then is is the appropriate comparator to use on those objects. So we looked at copying and how to make a copy. So if, let me, uh, let me go and uh, do some more of this sort of stuff. Let me say I had a string called uh, the number is, and I've got, a, I've got a number, and I go and print um, the string and the number. That's all good. Ah, but the comma introduces a space into the print. So I'll um, use string concatenation. I think we've done this. <laughs> Such as the plus. Ah, but you can't concatenate a stir and an int object. So I need to take that int and turn it into a string. How do you create a string from an int? It's str. str, no, 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 str is not a function. <laughs> str used to be a function, or the name str used to point to the built-in function str, but str is not a function anymore. <laughs> Dark corner. The string, it goes, stir, stir is not a function. You can't call stir. <sighs> Whoops. And interesting how this problem actually didn't occur here. It occurred back there. So I have rebound. In fact, I'm almost tempted not to say we don't even have assignment in Python. We bind a name to an object. So the binding of the name str to uh, the built-in uh, from the built-in function object to my string happened ages ago, and now I've got a problem. That's a, that's a dark corner. So how do I overcome that? Well, you've actually got a couple of options. One, uh, you could um, have not made the mistake in the first place. <laughs> P.S. Don't call variables the same as built-in functions. That would be one nice option. Um, another option is there is actually a built-ins uh, hook to the built-in function name, so I can use that module name to get to it. The only problem with built-ins is that it's actually not standardised, so it's, uh, I've got it here on this uh, implementation of Python, but not all Pythons have it. Instead, you'll use built-in. <laughs> the only problem with built-in 
is that it, it, the only problem we built in is it's not built in. <laughs> so you have to go and import built in, <laughs> and then you can use the built in. Now, if you thought that was bad, <laughs> I could always go and set the name and rebind that. <laughs> <laughs> For those on the audio, we're just hearing groans and no from the audience. Yes, my friends. Print true. No. Don't try to do a loop. <laughs> um, some of these, uh, that particular issue is fixed in 3, in Python 3. In Python 3, the names true and false are actually keywords and um, will give you an interpreter error at that point. So tip, use Python 3. So it's only a name, rebinding the built-in names. I showed you that built-ins is not standard. So import built-in and then you can, you, <laughs> watch out. None has actually been a keyword for a while so you don't have to worry about rebinding none. And we've looked at the pass by reference and how to pass by value. Accidental name creation. Let's go and look at some more programs like this one. Printing out. Sorry, yeah, any questions? Any questions about names? Sorry for interrupting so often. So I have a question. Uh, you used the list uh, instruction. Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah, there are. Uh, there's the copy module. Uh, so there's copy.copy, copy, uh, uh, copy.deep copy. The interesting thing about um, a, a very fine nuance in what I said there is that uh, the list constructor takes an iterable. So copy.copy .copy will give you, if you've got a tuple, it'll give you a tuple. But uh, the list constructor will take a tuple and give you a list. And um, no prizes for guessing how you build a tuple from a list. The tuple constructor. And there are reasons to do that. If I'm always passing objects by reference to a function that the gentleman in the middle row wearing green has written, <laughs> then uh, how can I trust that he doesn't change it? I don't have a const keyword. Go C++. Um, so I could build a tuple and then pass it if, I, if there was a danger, being cognizant of the memory implications and performance implications of doing that. And there was another question. The man in the checked shirt. Right. Um, okay. Um, I learned about that um, the line of T and the line of T. Yes, T. tabs. Right. The, the minus T. Yep. I didn't know that because I'd always just copy the tabs. Um, now, okay, I would have I'd picked up on the SCR variable name. Yep. That. Yep. But um, if I was going to use less, I might have accidentally used that. Mm. Yeah, yeah, good question. So the question is, for the benefit of the, uh, the video, um, can I stop the rebinding of built-in function names? <gasps> no. <laughs> the nature of the dynamicness of Python means that um, there is, and uh, I've got to be honest, we lose some of the protection that we get in other stricter languages. That problem never crops up in Java. <laughs> there are other problems that we get in Java. Um, but uh, the quick, I, I'm sure there's some weird interpreter hack that you could get in. One uh, technique I've used on one of my machines, not here, is actually just um, hacking the editor's syntax colouring config file and throw all of the normal sort of uh, function names into that so the editor will highlight that in a purple or whatever you've chosen for keywords, maybe as an allusion, um, but it's just a name. So I'm going to change my T-shirt. It's just a name. And uh, you can rebind it to whatever you like. Any other questions? Yes, sir, in the front. Just following uh, from that, do linters uh, help you? Say you've got a nice big code base with lots of <coughs> yep. numbers. Yep. And what happens to do that? Yep, yeah. You so, catch that in your automation. Yeah, yeah. There are other tools that can pick it up. Um, I've, I've got it on here, but I'm um, a big fan of the PyCharm IDE, and it actually picks up lots of the problems that rebinding names 
show as a secondary sort of um, uh, event, like uh, names only used once now. <laughs> And that's a thing that um, would be an indicator that maybe you got a typo, uh, that you've done a wrong rebinding. So this program goes and uh, uses my favourite os.walk to loop through from the current directory, printing out the directory name and the list of files. So when I go and run the program called names, I get not a list of files. Oh, file, files. And there, of course, I'm not printing out the list of files that os.walk gave me, because that's files. What's file? What is file? <laughs> it's a built-in class. The, uh, when you do an open, you're actually building an object of class file. Open is just a alias to the file constructor. And so that's giving me the class object. How do I overcome that? Well, accidental name creation is actually what we're talking about in this uh, one. Is it a problem? This is the way that Python works. If you don't like it, there's always Java. I don't have an easy solution for it, but um, spelling is not my strong point. <laughs> and you can avoid it with tools, as I was discussing, like PyLink, PyChecker, the PyCharm IDE. The language itself, um, I'm, I'm loath to say it has a deficiency. Maybe it's a, not a strong point. I come back to I love Python, and I have the, uh, the utmost um, admiration for the author and authors of it. How are we going for time? Uh, we're, we're having fun. Are we having fun? Yeah. 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 For the audio, the answer was universally, yes, there. <laughs> scoping, let's check that you know scoping rules. What does this program print? Anyone? Five, good. So far, so good. Let me um, change the program and go and change that so um, I get six, and then go and print out Pritten I. And that prints six and then five. So the binding of a name locally inside a function localizes the variable, or localizes the name. So that's a, that's a very interesting thing, because if I don't do that, we're talking about the global variable. And if I do do that, then that localizes it, and now we're talking about the local variable. So the real question comes up is, what does this print? 565 is a good, a reasonable answer. It's unfortunately not correct. 665 is a great answer, and actually, unfortunately, is not correct. 566 is a great answer and not the one that we have here. Anyone for four? <laughs> Seven? Anyone know? It's a fail. With a specific error that is gorgeously named because it's the only language that has a unbound local error. <laughs> An easy one to Google. But it's an important one to note that, see, having the same scope, the same uh, name, meaning two different scopes within one function, would be the sort of thing that R would do. <laughs> Sorry, R people. R is terrible. Uh, for scoping rules. It's great for other things. So that's just not allowed. You just can't do it. As soon as you do any assignment within that function, even if it was conditional, then that whole function, the scope of that name is the localized scope. And that gives you an interesting insight into Python's parsing. That while it's an interpreter in the Perl bash sense, it actually does compile and runs through the whole of the, the code, actually compiles it, PYCs are, PYOs are a, an outcome of that. So uh, watch out for unbound local errors. I mean. 
to be honest, global variables are probably a problem anyway, <laughs> and we should probably be avoiding global. So surprising namespace, namespace rules. So we've got the mainline scope variables, the unbound local error, and you can avoid problems by wrapping everything into a function. Once it's into a function, nobody else can see it. So then it's localized to that function. Do everything's in the function, including your mainline, and that will overcome that problem. The other option is to use my friend global, using friend in a loose sense. The global keyword, I'm not going to encourage, but uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes it's the most pragmatic um, solution and uh, that would change it to what some of you said. <laughs> so, um, but <laughs> that's my answer to using global. No. Having said that, uh, it's scattered all the way through the standard library, so. Well, let's just check how you go on, uh, on numbers. Who are my maths people? Excellent, good. So you'll be able to help me out here. Uh, one plus one minus two. Anyone, anyone? <laughs> Zero. <laughs> ah, <laughs> whoops. <laughs> With the dash two option. <laughs> Zero, good. Let me check that you understand this stuff. 1.1 1 .1 plus 1.1 1 .1 minus 2.2. Zero, hello, <laughs> come on people, <laughs> who's been to uni, <laughs> who, who finished high school, <laughs> who finished primary school, uh, okay let's do a harder one, minus 3.3, .3. zero, no, Almost zero, but quite definitely not zero. <laughs> what am I to say? Now, I'm bringing this up in a Python um, uh, talk, but it's actually got nothing to do with Python. Um, C has the same problem, Perl has the same problem, Ruby has the same problem. <sighs> They've all got the same problem because it's actually not uh, got anything to do with <laughs> Python, but I'm going to blame the IEEE that set the standard of how base two fractional numbers will be implemented in hardware. And they came up with a solution that's very fast, very good, um, with a couple of funny edge cases that all programmers in any language need to know about. And uh, watch out for the, uh, for the point one. It's not Python's fault. <laughs> Python makes it very easy for me to demo it, but it's actually got nothing to do with Python. Nonetheless, Python programmers dealing with numbers could quite easily come across that, uh, that uh, challenge. How do I solve it? Don't use floating point. <laughs> use ints. Yay. They'll scale to any size. Ints turn into longs in two or larger ints in three. So do everything in ints. Or just be careful. Are you actually expecting that to come out at actually zero? Use round. Um, 3.5 uh, has a, um, uh, an almost round, uh, an almost equal. Or go down the decimal class, you'll sacrifice performance massively, but then you can have tunable number of decimal places and much better control over the rounding techniques that it uses. Okay, let's see if anyone here knows Python. Anyone here know Python? <laughs> you thought you, anyone here started thinking they knew Python and now you're not so sure? So n can be five. And um, what's the value of plus plus n? <laughs> Damn, I'm having fun. <laughs> this is such a fun group. The answer to plus plus n is five. There is no plus plus. <laughs> there is no spoon. No, there is no plus plus. There's no plus plus, there is a plus, as in the positive of n. So the positive of the positive of the positive of n. And therefore, there's no minus. So the minus minus of n. Oh uh, no, the minus minus of n 
would be 5. The minus, 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 minus of n is minus 5. <laughs> 50 percent of the time I give that demo, it works, and <laughs> the other 50 percent. But I've been doing it over the last few days. I've been keeping on doing it, and I've been a string of getting it wrong, so I knew it would come out, <laughs> statistically speaking. Um, of course, so, but there's no plus plus following. That'll be a syntax error. So there is no plus plus as a increment operator. Instead, you can use plus equals. Which goes and adds one to it. Same, same fail in C and Perl and Java. Uh, not in Java. Actually, that would be in Java if it was a primitive type. So uh, watch out for your plus equals. It's plus equals, not equals plus. The spacing is irrelevant. That's the best I can give my C++ friends that want a plus plus operator. And that will do your increment. Uh, a couple of other scary little operators. That's out of... Um... <laughs> what? the Python logical range operator, which we typically use 0 less than n less than 10, um, is actually an and logical operator. So that's uh, n gets is 0 less than x and x value-wise comparison to y. We rarely use uh, uh, that, to be honest, as a beginner. If you came across that, you'd be like, Nah. <laughs> I thought Python was supposed to be easy to read, but it's just a uh, it's just a extension of the range operator in Python, which PS is a gorgeous operator and hardly any other language on the planet has such an operator. It's actually a really nice way of doing that, but it's actually an and. So that is, is woo, zero less than we are getting through our stuff. Coding standards, just watch out for division. Seven divided by two. <laughs> In Python, two, that'll be three. How much do you know? What's well, minus seven divided by two? This isn't C, this is Python. If it was C, you'd get a different result. Watch out for the flaw. Solve with coding standards, care, funky syntax. You can put stuff after the colon. Don't. <laughs> you can use the semicolon. What? In Python. Rather, you didn't. Slicing is funky syntax. You like my little slice there? <laughs> um, it's lovely syntax. Reversing a string, we don't have a reverse on string. Slicing. So my statement to my students when I'm teaching, um, if you want to get good at Python, get good at lists. If you want to get good at lists, get good at slicing. Slicing is very good syntax to know. Split and join are your friends. And in Python 2, the double angle printing to standard error is what? Now, let me uh, go back to my list. Have I still got a list? No. Let me go and get a list, one, three, two. Let me go and sort that. Yep, good, must have worked. And let me go and look at the object. <laughs> Where's all my data? That's called free. <laughs> So sort, or Python in itself, does not have a void return type. That would be one thing I'd like to see, that a function could be defined as this is an illegal assigner, cannot be assigned answer, and that would stop that. Sorting, yeah, it returns none. You could go for sorted, and in that case, sorted would have worked, but waste of memory. Use the in-place version of sort. It's, uh, it's very efficient, where you need to get a new different list, you can use sorted. Watch out for strings versus numbers. Two and three do that quite differently. No return type. Paths. Ah. 
Uh, I love pickle and um, I get people writing a pickle program to pickle their data and they call it pickle. <laughs> and it's the same as rebinding the name. The first, the first directory in SysPath is current. So it looks in the current directory first. So watch out for your SysPath. Be very careful of your SysPath. So we care. And my, uh, my friend Idle, which lots of people hate, actually has a really nice SysPath browser. Naming convention un in un Okay, so we're going to use underscores. Nice 1960s style. We've got raw underscore input. We've got int.bit underscore length. We've got sys.float underscore info. That's going to be the standard, okay? Yeah. Well, what about two bytes and current thread and basic conflict? Oh, okay, so we're going down the Java style. Okay, what about... <laughs> What? <laughs> Inbox message, what? What do I have to say about that? <sighs> There's no solution to it. I don't have an answer. There, there is a solution for your work, for your, for your department, for your company. There's things you can do about it. Um, the standard library. Some of it's fixed in Python 3, so one of the big dramas we've got in getting over to 3 is the fix on many of the uh, uh, naming conventions, particularly of modules and uh, packages. Um, I can only implore you to have a good coding standard. Starts with PEP8 and builds on that, which leads me to versions, probably the darkest corner, the bit that is uh, taking a while to overcome, the two versus three. Um, get used to three, it's coming. <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, there are some version two packages that are extremely slow in moving over to three, and if you're stuck with those, you're going to be stuck for a bit longer. You can have two and three on the same machine and do that wherever you can. Um, Ansible may well be re relevant to many of you, Fabric, Supervisor. Having said that, there are some version three only packages. <laughs> and um, if you check out the uh, Python 3 wall of superpowers, which shows us our downloads from uh, Py uh, uh, Python package index on which are two compatible and which are three compatible. It's becoming green. And uh, or you, be aware of the two to three conversion uh, script that'll take your two scripts and turn them into version three. So, uh, and also be aware of the from the future import. And that's a great way to start using things like real division, uh, the print function that solve um, a number of these inconsistencies. I get used to the future. I should give a keynote about the future. <laughs> um, and start working towards version three now. <sighs> um, applaud. <laughs> We probably have about time for like one or two questions, or are there any hands? I have a free gift for anyone that's asked a question. Not that you're asking a question. Yes, sir. When you uh, had that function um, with the i equals 5 and i equals 6 and so on. Yes. Um, is, that, is it still a problem that if you use a for loop there? That the for loop oh. actually doesn't do the scoping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You'd be better, you'd be okay in that because the first. Uh, sorry, the, oh, you got the you got the got the question on uh, that. You'd be okay because that does an assignment. Yep, to start, and so it'll be localized for that function. So for loop is is a useful technique in that point. What I meant, if you just imagine the function called to be a for loop, and then you had i equals five, you ran the the for loop. And then after the for loop, you actually get the last value of the last iteration of the for loop and yes. not the global scope. Yeah. So if you're for, for, then that's an assignment. So the very first thing that that does is the assignment. So you could do it with a while loop if you preferred. And that therefore becomes the initialize that therefore localizes the name within that. Thank you. Questions? I just wanted to clarify your intonation on the last slide. 
Yes. You were saying, about questions. No, the one before that. <laughs> you you were saying be aware of as opposed to beware of. So the two to three script that will do your conversion, you were yes. saying that's a great thing, be aware of it. Ah, uh, or... right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I see the, uh, the yes. Um, Sorry, I'm a foreigner. <laughs> that's not obvious. The, let me rephrase that, uh, that point. Um, the two to three tool that's shipped with Python since uh, two point uh, something, six at least, um, is a very useful tool. And so you should be cognizant of it. It should be in your awareness. And when you are ready, try it out. You know, There's actually some things that will warn you about, oh, this can't be trivially converted. And so then you can start excising that from your <laughs> programming style so you don't do that anymore, um, making it easier for you to get to Python 3. Um, as, a, as a rough figure of my clients, um, <sighs> Probably, I've got about 15% uh, of them are now on Python 3 as their primary Python. Um, so I'm working actively to help them make that transition. And there's a lot of good reasons to do that. I mean, Python 3 is at 3.5 now. It's been around for, what, seven years, I think? Six, seven years. Um, it's, it's faster, cleaner, nicer, and fixes some of the problems that I've highlighted in this talk. That's probably it. If you asked a question and you didn't get a toy, uh, come and collect one. Um, if you have any other questions, um, or if you're interested in me professionally um, and the work that I do, and if I could come and help your company, I'd be happy to talk to you about that as well. Thank you so much, Peter. <laughs>